Good morning. God bless you all. Welcome to our worship service this morning as Kaiser Christian Church. Welcome everyone from home or wherever you're at. Let's begin our time of worship together with music. Stand and join with me in the call to worship. From our wanderings and our wonderings, we are welcomed home by God. Lost on the highway or trapped on a cliff, God comes to rescue and return us to safety. Come to be found, for all are welcome here. You pray with me. Shepherding God, gather us into your presence as we come to worship this day. Transform us into your people through the mighty power of your Spirit. Rescue us with your endless patience that we may become instruments of mercy and grace to help others find their way home. In your mercy and grace we pray. Amen.
And then if your birthday is in the month of September, please stand so we can bless you with the happy birthday song. Happy birthday. Every once in a while, uh, our Sunday mornings, um, there's a lot more on the calendars. It, it feels like, you know, looking ahead and, and seeing the, the things in parentheses, like, oh, it's that day, and it falls on a Sunday this year. And along with all the other things on our minds that, that, that tend to, to bleed into our time here and that, that color our experience of, of worship, our, our regular concerns and anxieties and, and joys and blessings. Uh, we oftentimes have those those things on our minds too. You know, Sundays where we celebrate birthdays for the month. For some people, today might be their birthday. We we have things on our minds about that we see in the news. You know, unrest overseas and and fires in, in our own community and. In South Salem, people being evacuated over the weekend and turn over that and, and myriad other places and knowing that today is also for our country a day of remembrance of that there are people still remembering the, the pain of that day and the loss, uh, not just of maybe family or friends, but the, the cumulative and, and communal loss that we all experienced of you know, safety that we thought we had enjoyed in our country and that that necessarily wasn't the case anymore. And, and in the 20 years since, having to, to figure out, you know, in some ways, who we are and who we're going to be, and we're still working on that. So when we... gather and we communally come before our Creator Sunday morning like we always do, bringing all of our prayers together, all of our, our hopes and our anxieties and our, our joys, our remembrances. We remember that even in the light of remembering times of, of deep sorrow, anger and fear, as people of faith, faith, we remember that God calls us to great peace and joy to help make the world a better place. A place where we don't always have to keenly remember such times of despair, but one where the memories of better things outweigh memories of such sadness. Will you pray with me this morning? Gracious and loving God, God who calls us to so much more than we can imagine, who calls us to be instruments of your peace. As we remember events from long ago, acts on this country and people of our country, the people lost, not just in those singular events, but in the aftermath and the fallout from those events. As we remember also those that we have lost more recently, 
those we continue to pray for, that they may receive your healing presence, O God. Thanksgivings for times of joy and peace amidst the chaos. We invite your spirit into each of our lives, the lives of our community, that you might inspire us to even greater joy and peace, that you might show us ways to be in relationship with one another, to seek each other out with your divine purpose at heart. To build one another up, not to tear down. Lord, hear our prayers. Hear our prayers this morning and all mornings. Hear our cries of joy. and our wails of sadness. Hear our murmurs in the dark and our exclamations on the mountaintops. Be with us, O God. Be with us this morning as we praise and worship you, your Son Jesus, whom you sent to save us. Let us continue in worship this morning as we pray the prayer that he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
somebody justified Cause if you've got pain He's a pain taker If you feel lost He's a way maker If you need freedom or saving He's a present shaking savior If you've got chains He's a chain breaker Blessing on the children in our community this morning. God of all righteousness, of all blessing, God who continually invites each of us to the table, we pray your blessing upon these young ones this morning, those we know and those whom we do not know, the ones we see on the buses going to school, sometimes the buses we get stuck behind, our hurried frustration, that we just ask your blessing of, of safety and security upon them, that they might feel, whether they know it's you yet or not, the warmth and love of your presence, O oh God, in their lives. Amen. You wouldn't guess that it's often me that gets stuck behind the, the school buses when they start running again, back and forth to daycare in the morning, would you? This morning we're continuing, of course, in our new series on investigating the question, what disciples do? We continue through Luke this morning looking at the passage of the parable of the lost sheep and the lost coin, Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 10. We leave Jesus' experience last week with the, the multitude of people crowding around him and following him on the way. And now we find those quite possibly the same tax collectors, and sinners mixed in with the crowd coming near him to listen. Possibly those same Pharisees and scribes who grumbled a couple weeks ago, continuing to grumble at their presence. It says, now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him, and the Pharisees and scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it. When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents.
It's interesting the the context that Jesus finds himself in. Recently, we we looked at the story of Jesus instructing the people he was eating with, the Pharisees and scribes, at their their home, one of their homes, and finding them all competing for position around the table. He tells tells them a story teaching them about the proper way to to interact, to, to humble themselves, how to serve one another. Here we find Jesus again around a table. A lot of the gospel seems to center around this image of who's welcome at the table. The the classic and traditional image for for us in the church for this very reason. It keeps coming up in Scripture. The stories Jesus tells, the experiences he models, kingdom living around, oftentimes happens around a table. It's not so much a, a part of our culture now, or, but then who you sat around the table with was a huge deal. If you were willing to sit and eat with somebody, this spoke volumes. It meant that you, you accepted them. You welcomed them, in fact. You didn't just tolerate them because you needed a place to eat your meal or, or have pity on them, you, you welcomed them as, as a friend. You, you, in fact, aligned yourself in some part or way with that person, giving them a, a deep sense of acceptance and welcome. And so here we see Jesus having done that with Pharisees and scribes, now he's doing it with tax collectors and sinners. We see the Pharisees and the scribes grumbling. They seem to be doing that a lot in stories we read about them. We find Jesus modeling exactly what he preached. Only only last week about being in relationship, about how we calculate the costs. Modeling that life out, reformatting the relationships for the people around him, their assumed acceptance of who and what could be at the table. He's reformatting that vision based on the kingdom of God. And he is immediately accused by these Pharisees as being with the wrong people. Like, oh, no, no, you couldn't have met these these ones. Obviously, they they didn't get the message from Jesus' previous parables. We know these stories really well, don't we? We've heard them for a long time. These are some of the stories that are so ingrained, not just in Christian culture, but but the prevailing culture in Western culture, not just here in North America, but across the globe. We say or make reference to a lost sheep to somebody. More often than not, they'll have an idea of what you're talking about, won't they? They know this story. The lost coin may be a a little more obscure because for some reason the lost sheep idea has grasped us. The the idea of a a wayward animal just wandering off. Many of us have some experience with that, whether you add livestock such as sheep or you had 
chickens or, or even a dog or a cat, they all wander off at some point, don't they? Our, our cat at home has recently begun adventuring outside, not because we really wanted her to, but because she snuck out one time and I didn't know it, and I started looking around late in the afternoon wondering where she was at, checked all her hiding places, and I didn't find her, and I was closing the house up for the night, and as I went to close the patio door, all of a sudden there she was on the wrong side, meowing pitifully at me, screeching almost to be let back in. And I couldn't for the life of me remember the, the last time that day I'd opened that back door. She was our lost sheep that day. But we have some familiarity with these stories, don't we? And, and again, as we've said before, sometimes that familiarity breeds a, a certain feeling of being stuck or solidified in our understanding when there is so much more richness to be had in these stories, no matter how old we are, how many times we've read them, because every time we do, we're just a little bit different people, aren't we? And so reading it this week in the light of other occurrences and, and happenings and, and taking into account who we are together, I found myself wondering and thinking and and being inspired by other theological minds, the, this idea that when you read this parable of the lost sheep, we oftentimes, we, we always count ourselves as part of the 99, don't we? And um, we've probably, you've probably considered it in this term so far, but I'm going to keep going on this thread. People invariably want to be, you know, one of those that Jesus calls the the righteous persons who need no repentance and that feels like our our goal right because the way we simplistically read some of these texts you know and and we take Jesus as often hyperbolic language you know and saying of course to the the people listening of course you would leave the the 99 and go after the one when economically that doesn't necessarily make Sense and so there's been lots of d discussion over these passages. Where like, well, in that culture, what would it mean? Would they actually have done that? Would you know what would would only uh, you know we assume that it was, since Jesus only talks about you know the one going after you know, the one shepherd going after the lost sheep. You know we assume there weren't any others. But so they but then we have to wonder would they really have gone out herding a hundred sheep on their own or or what? What did the physical locations look like? You know, how safe were the 99 that were left? And, and we just go off the rails wondering all of these things about what this story could, you know, what do the, the different variables and the intricacies of the story could have meant? What are the little nuggets of truth embedded in you know, cultural investigation and, and history and you know, shepherding practice of ancient Israel? Some of that's helpful. But it, it still doesn't get us away from the fact that we just want to assume that, that it's always somebody else that's lost. Don't we? That's easier and more comfortable. And, and we feel a call as Christians and we say, well, well, we're here in church. We're the 99 sheep, right? This is the, the fold that they are left in security. And, and we're called to, by this passage, by Jesus' story, to, to go out and, and reach the lost. You hear that language a lot in uh, different books and strategies for evangelism. We go out and reach the lost. Now, before we go forward with, with challenging that idea at all, I, how would you like to be somebody out just doing your daily life, trying to be the best person you can, and you have somebody come up to you and accuse you of, of being lost? You're the lost, and I'm called to come and rescue you because I'm either spoken or unspoken named as the righteous. 
called by God, like, how might you receive that? See people shaking their heads, like, I don't want to be called the lost. Not necessarily, certainly not by somebody else who I just saw run a yellow light or, you know, be overbearing to their children in the grocery store, or, you know, because we all make mistakes. People are always watching. Especially if they know you're a person of faith. It, so it, before we go forward, it's just important to recognize that it, this isn't a call to go around informing people that, of their, their sin or their lostness. But rather step back a little bit from our, our assumed understanding of the passage and, and our, our long-held interpretation, but just to think about for a minute that maybe and, and most probably and all honestly that we're all the lost ones. Whether we're sitting in a place of worship regularly on a Sunday morning or, or, or have committed our life to follow Jesus or not, that, that, that we're all a bit lost. Not 100% of the time, mind you. I think this is a somewhat variable existence for us. And I don't think maybe in, in, even in the story of uh, taking that image of a uh, hundred sheep, it probably wasn't always the same sheep that got pushed to the edge of the flock on the way to the, the fold for the night or the, the place of security and just kind of nibbled some grass and got left behind or wandered off. It was They probably took turns. And I think we're not so much different than that, quite honestly. I think that, one, we assume that the, that our, our place of worship or, or, or even a little better maybe in, in thinking our, our community of faith is that, that fold that Jesus talks about, that, that place of security that the shepherd leaves the 99 and that, you know, we by extension as God's hand and feet are, are called to go out and, and look for those, those lost ones. But what if this, this isn't the fold necessarily? What, what if this is the, the, the best place we have figured out and, and the community we have formulated, being led by God to, that best helps us connect with what that truly is. Yeah. This is a, a, at least a reflection of that existence, that, that sense of being found. This is oftentimes where we experience it, but it doesn't mean that we don't experience it other places and other times. Right? Some people we know that we would look at and consider lost because we don't see them on Sunday mornings, but we see them hiking a trail on Monday afternoons they're experiencing that sense of being found then. And then how do we build relationship and connect in community with them when it'd be so much easier if they just came here and did it? Wouldn't it? There's a lot going on in this passage. A lot Jesus is trying to communicate to those Pharisees and scribes. And, and it all comes down to that idea of the table. Who's around it? Who's allowed? Who's invited? We think about this story and we wonder when we hear this story. Where are we sitting when we hear these parables or when we read them? Are we the ones next to Jesus? 
one of the tax collectors and sinners just kind of watching Jesus tell the Pharisees and scribes something important? Are we, or are we the ones being addressed by the speech that have somehow missed the point? Or were somebody else just hoping for a chance to have a seat? It, it changes our reading and our hearing, doesn't it? Depending on where we envision ourselves around the table. Part of what this comes down to ultimately is is how we see ourselves in relation to to other people the people that god calls us to be in relationship with to to love find not because they're more lost than we are necessarily but because we are all a little bit stumbling around in the dark together we have some wisdom some faith to share. And we shouldn't always assume that other people don't. Even if we know they don't go to church. Think about somebody approaching you in, in that fashion. Just wanting to share some humanity with you. Know who you are. Share a little of who they are. Not just hand you a worship tract or pamphlet about Sunday service. Say, you should come, it's fun. But that it's really interested in knowing one another. The way Jesus did. We claim Jesus as our model for faith, as the, our great Savior and, and teacher and source of wisdom, the one who came to show us the way. But we, we too often ignore the actual way that he did things, the way he loved people. There's, there's a few... different ways of, of doing evangelism that kind of come out. There's, there's probably more than that, but we'll talk about, I'll just list three this morning that, that we see in the life of, of Jesus. Have this kind of, and, and that we're encouraged to and, and invited to. The first one is kind of a, a lifestyle evangelism where you you live out your faith wherever you're at, whatever you're doing. You, you are your genuine Christian self at the food bank, at the park with your kids, at the grocery store, driving your car, getting stuck behind school buses, grumbling like a Pharisee because you're going to be late or you just don't want to have to wait. We don't always wait for specific opportunities to reach out to people, but that we live that out by being a little bit vulnerable all the time. We want to pick and choose our moments for doing that, don't we? And we want to guard ourselves as much as possible when we do it, but that's not the model that we have, folks. That's the one we kind of build up for ourselves because it feels safer. Francis of Assisi describes it like this, encourages encourage people to, to preach the gospel at all times and, if necessary, to use words. Another kind of evangelism is, is a relational type of evangelism, and of course it has some crossover and overlap with this lifestyle evangelism where you just, that's who you are. But relational evangelism is around having the patience 
to build that relationship. And remembering that this is not a numbers game, people, because building strong relationship with with people takes time and energy, and and each of us can't do it with that many, quite honestly. Even though the model in the church has so often been, and I've heard people literally say this, like, how many people did you witness to or did you save? People have said that phrase. To me, that sounds audacious. Kim and I, as you know, were, were missionaries for a number of years overseas, and, and we had, I don't know how many conversations with other Westerners. And, and I don't want to be overly critical, but in all good faith, they you know, felt a call to go and, and reach the lost that they envisioned in faraway places. But keeping that mindset so solidified in their minds and their hearts, they, they also kept themselves separated, somehow trying to protect their, their identity of the righteous 99. And they would send reports back to their churches in the States saying how many people that they had saved how many conversions, and, and there was an expectation for ever-increasing numbers. Because that was the way that they could measure their effectiveness. But then we would talk to the, the people in the town that we knew that we had spent years building relationship with. <laughs> We'd ask, do you know these folks? Felt kind of stuck in the middle sometimes. We're like, do you know them? We're like, yeah, we know who they are. We don't really know them. We know that they bring food around and show movies and ask people to raise their hands to accept Jesus and they get a bag of rice. And the next month when they come, raise their hand again because they need the rice. They don't know what they're, what's in... I don't know where their hearts are at because they haven't taken the time. They had a reputation, not always a good one, because they wouldn't take that time to have the patience to build relationship, to put themselves out of their comfort zone, even in a, another country where they, they just transplanted their, their position of, of status and, and power into another place and did everything they could to keep it that way. And then we have the, the, the one we probably know the most, invitational evangelism, where, where you invite people to an event or a group. But you notice on this list, that's the, the last one that happens ideally after, after the first two have happened, where you're, you're, you're out doing your thing, you're living your genuine Christian self out there in the world, being a little bit vulnerable, getting hurt sometimes, you find someone you strike up a relationship with, and you start talking and learning about each other, having patience with each other, earning the right to speak into each other's lives, and somehow you end up sharing who you are as a person of faith. And people see you making mistakes, and asking forgiveness, trying to be better, asking more questions than you offer answers sometimes. And that's attractive to them. And so they ask questions themselves. And then you get a chance to invite them to something. And by that point, they're like, yeah, maybe I do want to come and learn more about your community that I hear and have heard you talking about. But that's not the first step. It wasn't the first step for Jesus either. What did he do first? He invited some tax collectors and sinners to dinner. Let's sit around and talk. A nearly blasphemous show of acceptance and welcome and, dare say it, even affection came first.
inspiring and, and, and living into a, a life of righteousness or comes later through that divine relationship. We do all of this. We remember and keep telling these stories because it's an extraordinary story. It's not just a story of, of some sheep or some coins. It's extraordinary maybe in the fact that out of wandering across the countryside and trying to keep track of wayward animals, the shepherd notices that there's one missing out of a hundred. There is a determination to find that one. There is a responsibility on the shepherd's part. It's not the sheep's fault or the sheep's necessarily the sheep's job alone to find their way back, is it? But the flock itself, that little microcosm of the kingdom of God is incomplete until the restoration of that one. And let us never forget that, that no matter where we see ourselves in the story throughout our, our lives as we read it and reread it and meditate upon it and, and make mistakes and find ourselves lost or found or somewhere in between, that we're never the shepherd in the story. Okay? We're not the shepherd. God is the shepherd. And in this story, for all those people around him listening, the Pharisees and the scribes and the tax collectors and sinners and his own disciples sitting nearest him around that table, ultimately what's happening here is God telling them and us, you are mine. I will find you. Tell them, yes, I made you in my image. And you are connected to me. I love you this much. As we hear this story and try to let that deep and abiding message of, of welcome at the table sink in, we can ask ourselves this question. Can we in fact receive this message? This extravagant love fully and we accept it those tax collectors and sinners gladly join Jesus around the table Pharisees and the scribes had a little more trouble they were still invited Can we fully receive this message God gives us this morning? We are God's. God will find us. God will help us find each other. Amen? Let us continue with our time of worship this morning and standing and singing our hymn of response. Number 480, I love to tell the story. Jesus, I'm 
Good morning. I have a prepared couple paragraphs, but I'm going to go off script. Um, as Pastor Eric was sharing with us in Luke's Gospel, I know I've been lost. I know I've been gone just this last year, so many trips, and come back and am welcomed, whether it's here at Food Bank or uh, you know, different, different events, men's breakfast on Saturday. And I thought how wonderful that is to be part of the body of Christ in that physical presence of being welcome. But about halfway through your message, Pastor Eric, I started thinking there's a spiritual piece to it as well. Because that welcome is with our Lord. And I know at times I've been lost there too. There are moments where prayer is easy. Remember. And I have that conversation. And there are times where it's a drought. But the moment that I turn again and start to have that conversation, I'm welcome again, just as I am here from being gone physically as well. And all of that is part of the kingdom that we strive for, that we believe in, is embodied here in Kaiser Christian Church, embodied in all of us, and our families, and our friends, and our neighbors. And it's just so wonderful to always be in a spot of knowing that God says, you are mine. Well, thank you for what you give to Kaiser Christian Church, whether that's in a physical sense, a spiritual sense, because altogether, it makes a difference. Will you join me in prayer this morning? Lord, we thank you for the stories of a joy-filled shepherd and the rejoicing woman, and all of us that know at any point in time we're yours, no matter how lost we think we are. Thank you for this opportunity to be part of the joy in giving and the fact that we can give you thanks. Lord, please receive the gifts that we bring and help us transform them to spread your joy in a world that is so often overrun by all that is lost. In your name we pray. Amen. We gather around this table each week because of Christ's invitation. We we in answer to the question, what do disciples do? We this week the answer is disciples we seek people, we seek relationship, we seek out those that are lost in, in ourselves, in our own communities, and, and outside those places. We do that because God seeks us first. Because it is God who seeks people. Seeks us out. Will come and find us because we are God's. We belong to God created by God in God's own image. Saved by God by the sending of part of that very image into our midst in the person of Jesus Christ. Who extends that invitation to be around this table. This physical space together as we worship, as a, a visual and tactile reminder of the spiritual connectedness that we have, not just one another in this place, but wherever believers gather, knowing that the invitation is not only extended to those who first believe, but who all would come if 
whatever amount of trepidation or question, like those tax collectors and sinners in our story this morning, whom Jesus invited, accepted, welcomed, loved, round the table. We know this is not our table, but it is one we are happy to come to. Happy to teach about, tell other people in relationship that God says they're welcome here also. Because we're all a little bit lost. Need a place to be found. Will you pray with us this morning? Lord, you gave us this bread and juice to feed our physical and spiritual lives. To remember you as the forgiving sacrifice who offered yourself to your Father. Lord, you offered yourself as the Lamb. We thank you for what you have given us, though we are unworthy. Help and save us, so that we may raise glory and thanks to you. Lord, help us to remember you at this time of communion and throughout the coming week. In your name, amen. Amen. We remember Jesus gathering with his disciples who, who themselves, not so unlike the Pharisees and scribes, sometimes just miss the point. But in no way did that Keep them from being invited over and over to the table with Jesus. Jesus gathered with them and he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it for them. Showing them again how much he loved them, enough to serve them unexpected and surprising ways. He gave them his body and he said, take and eat, take me into you. I am broken for you. And in like fashion, he took the cup, these mundane elements, and he shed them a new light on those disciples saying, this is the cup of the new covenant poured out for forgiveness of sin. As often as you drink it, knowing that they did it a lot, as often as you drink it, as often as you gather and share these simple elements together, remember me. Remember that I, in you, I will find you. Let us join in communion together this morning.
introducing our hymn of benediction. I think Kim has a reminder and announcement about the women's event. So. Using the mic in case someone's listening at home. Um, October 8th is the women's retreat in Portland at the Mary, Mary Hills Christian Church. Uh, it's Friday and Saturday, but Saturday the 8th is the day I'm going, and I'll also be taking my van, so uh, um, I'll be able to take a few passengers for any of the other women who'd like to go on Saturday with me. And you can find those uh, sign-up forms and uh, pamphlets about the event uh, in the narthex on the podium uh, as we gather to converse afterwards. So with that, let's all stand and sing our hymn of benediction. seek and be found.